Um, my name is Kathleen Hancock. I'm a founder and leader of the group Think Boulder. We started off as a group that um, was really trying to address the development to replace the hospital at Alpine Balsam. And we live in the neighborhood and it looked to us like it was possibly being overbuilt. And so we became sort of the moderate group that was trying to balance the neighborhood with new development. And since then, we've been in, involved in Boulder politics, um, mostly focused on housing issues and um, not over-densifying while trying to deal with housing affordability and environmental issues. This panel um, came about mainly because um, there was, a, there was um, legislation put forward uh, by Javier Mabre to remove the ban on rent control. In Colorado, you're not allowed to have rent control. No city municipality is allowed to do so. So um, the idea was remove that ban and let cities decide for themselves what they want to do. And this was a, frankly news to me. And it seemed to me that this is a policy that we should at least be exploring and we should be allowed to make a decision for ourselves of what we want to do. So I'm not, the, I'm not actually sure what I think. Um, I'm open to both sides hearing the pros and cons of rent control. So our rent stabilization, um, as it's now often called, um, a more flexible version. So um, that's the opening, and um, I'm super pleased to have our panelists here um, tonight, and um, really want to also recognize um, Bobby Klein, who's sitting over here. She did a lot of work in, in putting the pa panel together. Um, okay, yeah, applause for Bobby. <laughs> so, sometimes I think the organizers get totally missed. So, um, so I'm going to just introduce um, uh, Representative Judy Amable, and then she will take it over from there. So I want to make sure I get her um, committees correct. Um, Judy represents House Dis District 49, is, and so is the representative for most of us. She's the chair of the Business and Labor Committee and a member of the Public and Behavioral Health and Appropriations Committee, as well as Legislative Council. She's lived in Boulder since 1975 and has three adult sons, so she's seen a lot of change. Um, she is now a candidate for state senate, just launched her campaign. So thank you so much, and I'll hand over the mic to you. Uh, thank you, and thank you. I'm just going to say thank you for organizing this and for getting us all together and thank all of you guys for being here because there's probably other places you could be. You could be out fine dining or, I don't know, hiking up Sanitas, but you could, there's a lot of different things going on tonight. So uh, thank you for being here. And I'm just going to start by introducing the panelists and I'll start with Representative Mabry, who is my colleague at the State House. He uh, just finished his first legislative session, and I think he thought that was so really incredibly fun. <laughs> um, but uh, Javier is the representative for House District 1 in Denver, it, and Jefferson Counties. There's I don't no people in Jefferson County in my district, but technically I represent a plot of land in Jefferson County. <laughs> okay, and that plot of land has been very vocal. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so he was the sponsor of House Bill 231115, which uh, would have repealed the statewide ban on rent control and enabled localities to have, do, not to do anything, but to have rent stabilization and to tailor that in the way that they thought would be the best. Um, he helped found a nonprofit focused on keeping Coloradans in their homes. And that's kind of a mild way of saying it. He's been an incredible champion for eviction prevention. And uh, since 2022, his organization has represented thousands of Coloradans facing eviction and successfully advocated for significant policy changes to help renters in Colorado. And I think this uh, eviction work has been incredibly meaningful for all of the people that he has helped. So um, I don't know, are we clapping? Can we clap for Representative Mabry? Uh, next up is Chris Goodwin. And Chris is a retired CU staff member 
former local union president, former union organizer, and longtime local political activist. He was a founder of the Renters Rights Project and one of the co-authors of the 1981 Rent Control Initiative in Boulder that led to the statewide ban. So that was a big backfire. <laughs> uh, he has lived in Boulder since 1971 and is a documentary photographer. So thank you for being here. Yes. And then uh, at down at the end we have Todd. Is it Ulrich? Ulrich. And um, Todd is the past president of the Boulder Area Rental Housing Association and currently serves on its board of directors. He's the owner of PG Rentals, a property management company serving the Boulder area. And it doesn't tell me how long you've been here or any of that stuff. You can tell us if you want to. Okay, so thank you for being here. And So we're going to start off with each of the panelists are going to speak for about five minutes, um, if, but only if they have five minutes worth of good stuff to say. That's the, that's the upper limit. That's not the floor. And um, talk to us about why they're here tonight and what they're hoping to accomplish and what they would like for us to see us do here in Boulder and statewide that might um, help the city do the things that it wants to do. So let's just go down the, the road and we'll start with you chris uh, i'm actually here to give you a brief hopefully five minute history of our uh i'm sorry speak up uh, i think i'd rather sit anyhow a five minute history of the uh, renters rights project and our uh campaign to try and win rent control for the city of boulder and this all happened such a long time ago, I should probably start with once upon a time. Uh, it was 1980 when the Renters' Rights Project started up. We were planning on working on a number of different renter issues, including uh, rent control, but we, we talked about interest on security deposits. There was a model lease proposal that we put forward to the city. Uh, we even supported a city attempt that came actually it succeeded from the human relations commission to ban adults only housing at the time landlords could say they wouldn't rent to people with kids and that was eventually uh, outlawed by the human uh, by the city council one of the best things they did uh, but the main issue was always uh, rent control and we spent quite a few months studying ordinances from around the country mostly ones from California and uh, New Jersey. And uh, after a couple months of that, I think that didn't take too long because we were, we were pretty intense about it. A lot of meetings, a lot of hours. And by late 1980, we had learned all we needed to know. We decided we would go forward with uh, writing an ordinance and trying to petition it onto the ballot. Uh, there was no chance at the time that the city council was gonna put it on for us and uh, uh, they really, they, didn't, they weren't gonna pass it themselves either. So we uh, modeled our ordinance off, uh, off the ordinances from those other cities, successful ordinances that were working uh, very well. Uh, so let's see, the petition drive began in early 1981. I think it was like the end of February, where we needed 5,000 signatures to get to the ballot. We had no doubt at all we would get those 5,000 signatures. We were, we were very confident about that. In fact, we had even talked about making it to the ballot in 81, losing maybe on the initiative, and then turning around and doing it two years later if we had to in 83. That's the way it had been won in a couple, at least a couple cities in, uh, in California. Uh, so let's see, we, we were expecting some serious opposition. Uh, in fact, uh, a few days after we had a press conference announcing the petition drive, I look at the front page of the Daily Camera one morning and there's a headline saying that the landlords, it was the Colorado Apartment Association then, had announced a uh, crusade against rent control. 
So it, it began uh, a crusade against us. Uh, then the unexpected happened. We had started the petition drive, and uh, we, like I said, we knew we were going to make it. It was very well received. I think we did a little door knocking on it. Uh, but then the, uh, the crusade took another route that we weren't really anticipating, and the, uh, a bill to ban rent control in the, in the entire state was introduced in the state legislature. Uh, it took about two months for it to go through the process. There were some maneuverings back and forth, but uh, eventually uh, it did pass. Uh, we did have uh, one last gasp at trying to keep moving forward. Uh, the, the, the legislature, by the way, at the time was controlled by the Republicans. Uh, there was a Democrat governor, it was uh, Dick Lamb. And we, uh, uh, an ally of ours in, uh, in Denver, uh, arranged a meeting with the governor to try and talk to him about vetoing uh, the ban. Uh, he acted like he was friendly to the whole concept. You know, it was like, I'm sorry, I wish I could help you, though. I, I, I can't, I'm dealing with the Republican legislature. I can't veto everything. You know, blah, blah, blah. That's actually what it was. The meeting with the governor is, and what happened afterwards is a whole other story that I don't want to take time because I would go way over the five minutes. Needless, really? <laughs> okay, okay. All right, well, then the other part that I wanted to talk about we can hopefully get to in, uh, in the discussion part. Uh, but that, that kind of killed the whole effort right there. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll relinquish the microphone. Representative Mabry. Great. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here today and engaging on this critical conversation. Um, I think no matter where we land on this issue, I think everybody can agree we are in a housing crisis in Colorado. And uh, people are having trouble um, affording to live in the communities where they work. People are having trouble affording to live in the communities where they want to keep their kids in school um, for the four years of high school or for all years of elementary school. And I think everybody here uh, agrees we need to do something about that. Um, for me, this issue is personal. Um, I was raised in uh, South Denver by a single mom whose only source of income was her social security disability check. And we were evicted um, more than once. Um, we'd gotten eviction notices and we self evict. Um, but eventually when I was a teenager, we were ultimately evicted to the point where we were forced out of our homes. The locks, the locks uh, were changed and um, dealt with homelessness in the aftermath of that. Um, I'm a high school dropout, but I went back to school because I wanted to help people like my mom. And I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to do so in law school. Um, I was fortunate in that I was admitted to uh, the University of California, Berkeley on a scholarship. Um, and all three years there, I did landlord tenant work. I worked with a woman um, who I can't say her name, so we'll just call her um, Susan Smith. Uh, Susan Smith was an elderly black woman, um, about 68 years old. Um, she lived in downtown Oakland. Um, she'd never lived anywhere other than Oakland. The furthest she'd ever traveled was Stockton, California, um, which is uh, about a two hour drive uh, from Oakland. Everybody she knew was in Oakland. Her, her family was in Oakland. Um, her entire life was there. Um, and I was representing her in an eviction case. Her unit was rent controlled and um, the uh, new owners who had bought the property desperately wanted her out. And the reason why they wanted her out is her rent was $586 for a two bedroom apartment. It was $586 for a two bedroom apartment because she started renting in 1992 it was a small mom and pop landlord and that small mom and pop landlord set the rent at that amount because they were making a profit at that amount back in 1992. Um, and they never raised the rent until they died. The landlord died in about 2011. 
um, and then the property was sold off. Um, and then after the property was sold off, um, like I said, the new landlord was trying to get her out. They are able to raise the rent in Oakland when you're in a rent controlled unit by inflation. Um, and this woman's rent had been raised accordingly up to about, like I said, about $600. Um, in her case, um, we were picking the jury. We were about to go to the trial. And I was confident that we were going to win. We had a good, strong defense, and I'm not going to get into um, uh, what that defense was. Um, but um, the landlord's attorney offered her $10,000 to move. And she jumped up and down. She was like, $10,000. Oh, my God. This is amazing. And we sat her down, and we were like, Miss Smith, where are you going to go? Where are you going to live? All you know is Oakland. You need to hang on to this. Um, and this story, this is why um, I believe that Colorado needs to open the door for communities to allow for municipalities to protect Mrs. Smith's across Colorado. And again, remember the beginning of this, right? Like the landlord got to set the rent at what the market would bear when the unit was available when she was trying to rent it. And so their profit was built in at that point. And so... Um, um, what we're talking about is not allowing for unlimited profits. We're, we're, you can still profit under every rent control scheme in this country. Under every rent control scheme in this country, um, when a unit is open and a unit is vacant, it is set, the rent is set at what the market will bear. What rent control is about is in rent increases moving forward. So when those units are vacant and landlords are renting on the market, they're, they're building in their profit already, right? And I understand that landlords need to make a profit, right? It's an investment. And I don't know where I'm at on time. Four seconds. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I wanted to illustrate what we were working towards with the story. I definitely have more facts and figures that I'm sure we'll get into. Um, and yeah, thank you all again for having me today. Okay, Todd, you're up. slides are on the handout they're a little more focused on Boulder some of the questions I think will uh, come into play with the slides later but okay um, well I guess I wasn't quite sure how to cover what we were talking about to start out today so I really want to start my portion of the discussion with something that I don't really hear in the context of this topic and it's that I think we actually want the same outcome from what we're talking about here, but I think it's the methodology of, of how we accomplish that that is a little different. Um, so looking at how rents are set in different markets, they are kind of a chain of events. You start with the initial acquisition of the property, the building, there may be upgrades or code work that needs to happen to it. There's marketing, there's management. Um, these are all costs that go into having that property. and then you mix that in with the supply and demand of the market you're in, and the market is really what determines the rents. You can ask a certain price, but if it's too high, nobody will rent it. If it's too low, you, you may lose money and not be able to keep up with the building. So that chain begins with costs, and as more units, and more costs are added to the units as they're being ready for occupancy. The costs also continue when the units are occupied as they age. And placing a cap on rents prevents the owners from being able to make those necessary uh, improvements and recoup the money necessary to do upgrades, pay for taxes, insurance, upgrades, things like that. Now, one of the things I was curious about in this discussion, I just didn't have an understanding, is what this rent control would look like, the proposal. And I don't know that we know because there's so many different municipalities and they may do it differently. So I guess I'm going to try and keep my comments kind of vague on that because I don't know specifically what we're talking about when it comes to Boulder. Um, whenever rent controls have been implemented, I, I heard you say there was some success with that, and I'm not sure how that's defined. But there is a small set of the population that does benefit from that, and those are usually the people that are in the properties when the new law is implemented. Uh, anybody relocating to that market, migrating within the market, um, don't get that benefit. I represent one of the ways to lower rents that is very effective is to 
reduce the costs along that chain of events. Uh, everything from permit fees to insurance to taxes, all of that adds costs which then gets passed on to the renter um, when those rents are, are uh, increased to cover those costs. So one other thing, there have been some studies about this and again, this may not be specific to the proposal for this area, but there is a recent study that I thought was really interesting. It came out of Stanford. It was, I believe it was either 2017 or 2018. I'll just give you the title and I wanted to read the abstract because it speaks to kind of what we're talking about when it comes to the costs that go into running, managing, owning these types of buildings and then being able to recoup the, the rent you need to keep up with them. So the title of it was The Effects of Rent Control on Tenants, Landlords, and Inequality, Evidence from San Francisco. So it was uh, published in the American Economic Review in 2019, and this is a three or four sentence abstract that I just thought was a good description of kind of um, maybe an argument against certain types of rent control, but maybe an argument for getting control of some of those costs. So the abstract is, using a 1994 law change, we exploit the quasi-experimental variation in the assignment of rent control in San Francisco to study its impacts on tenants and landlords. Leveraging new data and tracking individuals' migration, we find rent control limits renters' mobility by 20% and lowers displacement from San Francisco. Landlord, landlords treated by rent control reduced housing supplies by 15% by selling to owner-occupants and redeveloping some of the buildings. Thus, while rent control prevents displacement of incumbent renters in the short run, the lost housing supply locally drove up the market rents in the long run, ultimately undermining the goals of the law. So that's part of this that I wanted to, to discuss and cover. Um, like I said, I'd, I'd love to hear more details about what is proposed for our uh, market. I just, I don't know that yet. Okay. Thank you for that. So just to give you guys a little lay of the land, I have some questions here and we're gonna do questions until what time? These are my questions, and then we're going to open it up to for you all to ask some questions, too. Okay. No problem. So we're going to do some Q&A now, but, you know, think about what questions you all have, and we'll open it up for questions uh, when, when we're done. So um, the first one is for you, Todd, just to talk about just as a follow-up to what you were just talking about, here in Boulder, what are the challenges that the landlords are facing? Well, increased cost is number one. Um, the regulations and restrictions on building are challenging. Um, I've heard developers say it's incredibly difficult to get things built here, but once you do, you're in. It's, you know, get into the market, and it's a good market. Um, there's new legislation coming at, from the state level. There's uh, new ordinances on, on the city level. Um, one of the challenges we're facing right now is um, it has a lot to do with what goes on, on on the hill and there doesn't seem to be very much enforcement. And so that's impacting everybody. Neighbors, landlords, even the tenants. And um, that's, I still think, yet to be seen how that's going to affect our market, but it is. Okay. I mean, I would be very interested to know what can the city do to rein in the landlords who are doing a terrible job up there and renting properties that are substandard and not monitoring what's happening and making it uncomfortable for the neighbors, whoever they are, whether they're fellow CU students or, and, and that's maybe not a topic for today, but I think that's something that is definitely worth talking about. Um, and some of the property management companies that are more focused on the bottom line than they are on potentially doing a good job uh, for the neighborhoods that they're renting in. But um, let's see, Chris, as a longtime renter, besides prices, what are some of the challenges for Boulder renters? Uh, price has always been the number one problem for me. I've been pretty lucky over the years. Uh, the places I've lived have been taken care of the way they should be, and they've generally been decent places to live, if not overpriced. Uh, if I could, I'd like to address some of the things that Todd, sorry, 
raised are our, our ordinance directly addresses a lot of those issues uh, for one uh, uh, our ordinance did not include what Javier just described which was called vacancy decontrol back then uh, there wasn't a period where if somebody moves out the landlord can then raise the rent to whatever they want it's called the market but I don't believe that that market exists I think that's more uh, a fairy tale than, than anything else but our, our ordinance contained these things uh, it gave the landlord uh, the right to raise the rent in accordance with their cost increases that was guaranteed in the ordinance there were automatic pass-throughs uh, costs they could pass along to the tenant for uh, property tax increases utility increases insurance increases that was in the ordinance there was also a clause in there that was in all the ordinances we studied that guaranteed that the property owner would always get a fair rate of return on investment as, as, as a legal term and the other cities did that because they wanted to make sure they couldn't be challenged on court uh, in court uh, let's see we exempted small landlords three units or less you were not covered by the law I think if it was today I would probably make that number higher uh, renters uh, talking about properties deteriorating because maybe the rent isn't being raised high enough so the landlords would say in that kind of a situation uh, it would be kind of a dumb thing for landlords to do to say well I'm not going to do more repairs because I'm not getting this rent increase because under our ordinance the renter would be allowed to go to the rent control board and petition for a rent decrease so they'd be essentially driving themselves out of business and I don't think anybody is, is, is dumb enough to do that especially I mean they're owning rental property in Boulder Colorado uh, I think. Ah. Uh, let's see uh, there was uh, an exemption for new construction that happened after the ordinance took effect so it didn't didn't affect that uh, the one unique provision we had in there that most of the other cities none of the other cities had uh, a rent increase would go through if the renters did not object to it if they thought it was a reasonable in increase uh, the landlord would get it now the rent control board also would have a uh, the authority to step in if they felt that they needed to in a situation like that uh, our intent there was maybe that there would be some actual bargaining between renters and, and the property owners over what the rent should be, maybe even a collective situation where people who live in an apartment complex would, would bargain over the rent. Uh, so I think all those things, uh, they kind of contradict a lot of the myths that, uh, that you hear about, about rent control. Uh, yeah. okay. Well, let me ask you, Rep. Mabry, what was in your bill and how did that address some of these things? And what were the fears that you heard uh, being expressed from the landlord community? And um, were there some things in the bill that addressed th those concerns? Yeah, so um, I keep forgetting that this mic is not amplifying my voice, so it's like weird to talk into it. Um, the initial thought behind this bill, right? Like not only is this a bill aimed at making housing more affordable, but this is also just about democracy and local control, right? And so the initial idea behind the bill was, all right, we'll just repeal the statewide ban and communities can do what is best for them, right? And, um, you know, I don't know, how long all of you all have lived in Colorado, but we're Coloradans. Like we know like Denver and Boulder are going to have this conversation when we lift the ban, right? Like maybe some mountain towns, right? And of course, in those communities, they're gonna get into some of these nuances that, that uh, Chris just talked about, right? Like um, allowances for property tax increases, right? And so initially the bill was just really bare bones. It was just delete this section of Colorado law. Um, you know, working with uh, members of uh, our housing committee who were concerned about um, the impact that this could have on development, 
um, we built in um, a few changes. One of, one of those was um, an exemption for new construction. Um, our, exempted, our exemption for new construction um, was on a rolling basis, 15 years, and it actually was retroactive. So it, 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 it meant that if something was built 15 years before the bill uh, came into place, um, then it was exempted. But it would be rolling, and so that it's not at any time um, uh, basically, if the bill passed in 2023, 15 years before 2023, there's an exemption, but then that shifts every year. Um, so that's, that's one of the things we, uh, we built in. Uh, another thing we built in uh, was clarifying that no municipality could pass an ordinance that did not at least allow for increases uh, of the rent according to inflation plus 3%, right? Now, again, uh, municipalities are going to be able to go beyond that. They could set it at CPI plus 10% if they felt like that, that was necessary, but that was the floor. It had to be at least, at least CPI uh, uh, plus 3%. There was also uh, some language in there about allowing um, these ordinances, allowing um, landlords to recover for maintenance cost, uh, um, any increased cost uh, having to do with the upkeep of the unit. Um, and you know, I think all these are reasonable, right? Like, like if 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 um, we can demonstrably prove that a rent increase is actually tied to an increased cost um, in an immediate way, I think that totally makes sense. That's not exactly what we're seeing out there in the community. I mean, so um, Rep. Amable mentioned um, during my introduction, I'm an eviction defense and housing attorney, and I've been doing this for. Um, four years now in Colorado, and in that short time, the increases I have seen are wild. People living in Thornton, in units that are infested by rats, are paying 2100 for one bedroom apartments, and they're working at Lowe's, and they're driving for Uber, and they're getting punished if they have bad credit. If they have bad credit, then they have to pay more. And, and come on, this is ridiculous. It's not tied to costs when, before the pandemic, it was the same owner and they were charging 1400 you know that I, I i just don't believe i mean maybe if you could prove it um but uh you know nobody we we had a lot of testimony on that bill i did a lot of stakeholding on that bill you know we heard a lot about oh well taxes are going up and this cost is going up and that cost is going up well in the units that are infested by rats are you actually repairing them you know and that's not to say that it's not a valid concern and it's a valid concern that we addressed. We built that in. And that's, that's, that's absolutely um, legitimate and um, should be a part of the conversation. Um, but, um, you know, again, the types of rent increases that we're seeing in, in, you know, these are the communities that used to be affordable. People would get priced out of Denver and they'd move to Thornton or to North Glen or to um, Aurora. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, people are paying around $2,000 to live in one bedrooms. And they're not making much more than $40,000 a year, if that. And um, we have to do something about that. And that's, that's what this whole conversation was about. And I also just wanna acknowledge my co-prime sponsor on this bill was actually Elizabeth Velasco. Um, and she represents uh, the Western Slope. Um, and she was brought uh, into this conversation because of what she's seeing out there. Right, like uh, people are commuting hours um, to go work in restaurants and hotels because there's just nothing affordable to rent in uh, the communities that they're working in. Um, okay, thank you. I'm, I'll just say that I grew up on the Western Slope in the same valley that Elizabeth Velasco lives in. And when I was in high school in 1971, not to date myself, but uh, there was a housing crisis and People were commuting, and um, we haven't solved it. And you could maybe think it's not solvable exactly. I, I don't know. But this isn't a new problem. This is an age-old problem, and especially for communities that are desirable to live in. Or even if it's not that desirable to live there, but if that's where the jobs are, then that drives up the housing costs. But I want to ask Todd, um, 
You know, I think one of the big concerns about rent control is this thing that some of you touched on about does that cause there to be less, do people convert? And then if everybody sells off their rental housing because that doesn't look like as good a return, then do we create more for sale housing? Is there any silver lining in that? Or maybe you could just speak about that a little bit. I guess I can touch on it a little bit. I won't say I'm an expert in some of that. Um, the research, sure. The research and the reading I've done and even the study that I was quoting did touch on that. And it seems the empirical answer is yes, it does reduce the housing stock um, based on the study, based on where it's been implemented. Um, there's quite a few out there that talk about that. Uh, the two major cities that have implemented it, New York and San Fran, uh, it does look like it has reduced the number of housing units that are available for rent, uh, with some of them coming offline just because they can't or won't be maintained. Um, as far as does it create opportunities on the buy side for owner occupants, I, I would imagine so, but I, I don't know that I've actually looked into that. I apologize. I don't have any info on that part of it. Oh, there's no problem. I, I mean, I, I hear the argument all the time that we, people will sell off their rental housing, and I wonder what happens to it uh, because it's still there. Um, okay. So, um, yep. Well, I can I can speak to that a little bit. I think. You know, one thing that um, we have to be clear about, because um, actually I cite, I appreciate you bringing up the Stanford study, because I also cite that study in support of rent stabilization, because two of the big points for it are, it lowers displacement and it creates stability. Why do we think Oakland is still 50% black? Like, do you think that Oakland, the, at the center of the Silicon Valley boom, would not have been fully gentrified it's by? Not the case. Uh, there was a study, this is Pew data, um, and the number of um, units that are permitted for occupancy per capita over the past decade, in every county, this is ranked by county, in every county that has rent stabilization in the country, um, they build more than every single county in Colorado except Denver, and Denver was like in the middle of the pack. And so that's, that's, that's just demonstrable that like, you know, all across New Jersey and California and New York and, and um, uh, well, we don't have enough data yet for Minnesota and Washington because they're new um, to the rent stabilization conversation and, and Oregon as well. Um, but in these places where they've long had it, they're, they're, they're building more housing. And so that's probably what you're getting at. Okay, so Chris, I wonder, because this is a bolder group and I see a lot of mixed reactions to the things that are being said. And so I wonder if this ordinance, this bill had passed, or if it passes in a future year, how, what, would you, what do you think would be the ideal plan for Boulder to implement, given that now, now they would be able to? Like, what would, would you like them to just do what you had proposed before? Are there some lessons learned along the way? Would you make any changes to that, or would you be sticking with what you previously proposed? The only uh, change that I'm, I'm looking at this list of the different provisions, I think it would be fair to increase the number of units that small landlords could have and be exempt from the law. I think that's fine. I think the rest would be too important to change, particularly the ability of renters to ask for a rent decrease if things deteriorate. I think even the section that kind of encourages uh, uh, tenants and landlords to get together and bargain over rents is a very important one. Uh, the rate and, and the, run, the rate to uh, raise rent in accordance with cost increases guaranteed. I I don't know if somebody else would come up with changes they would want, but. I think this was a very strong ordinance based on a lot of cities that used pretty much the same thing. So I would, wouldn't, change, uh, wouldn't change very much at all, if anything. Okay, so Rep. Mabry, maybe you could speak a little bit to what is your plan going forward? So just to give you all the history, I'm not sure if everybody knows, but the bill that Rep. Mabry ran last year did, it was under the threat of veto 
from the governor's office. He made it pretty clear that he was not going to sign that bill. And I think that was part of why the bill didn't get through. So it passed through, through the House, uh, but didn't make it out of, was it, did it die in committee in the Senate? Or? So it died in a Senate committee. And um, so the question is, are you planning to bring it back or what, what's your plan? Uh, and for the sound people, I don't know if this mic is still working because a red light came on. Um, and so, um, okay, great. Um, so, um, we have an immense amount of work to do in the housing space in Colorado, period. Even outside the scope of this specific uh, conversation. We know we have a governor that's hostile uh, uh, Okay, now it's working. See, I knew something was up. I knew something was up. Um, <laughs> uh, so, look, we have a lot of work to do in this space. Um, a thing that, that recently came up is, um, and we got lunch a few weeks ago and I talked, uh, spoke with you about this, um, but uh, there was a Colorado Court of Appeal decision um, that came out um, recently uh, that made it a lot more difficult for tenants to assert their rights under the warranty of habitability. So that's already really hard here in Colorado, right? That's like why when I hear a case um, and, and I'm actually in court interviewing tenants and they're telling me, hey, this is rat infested, this is roach infested, it's like really, really hard for us to bring that up and actually hold the landlord accountable. Um, the Colorado Court of Appeal decision made that more difficult. And so I think we need to um, provide some clarity in that space because that's just like basics, right? Like there should be heat provided in the winter, right? And also I just want to clarify, like the vast, vast majority of landlords do these things, right? And so any changes there are not going to negatively impact anybody who's complying with the law. Um, but I think we need to clarify uh, um, for the courts that the process for tenants should be easier. And so that's something that we're going to do. Um, we need to do something about evictions. Um, no fault evictions are a big problem here in Colorado. Um, probably folks who pay attention in this room are aware that I also led the charge on good cause for eviction protections here in Colorado. That's another fight. Uh, uh, we need to have, um, you know, also with HH, right? People are probably talking about HH, right? I am opposed to HH. I, I, I voted no. Oh, HH, HH is uh, the property tax measure that's going to be on your ballot. Um, and uh, anyways, basically what it does is it phases out the Tabor refund to pay for, yes, it does give some money for schools, which I did like, um, but it also pays for big property tax cuts, and but renters are totally left out of that conversation because everybody gets a Tabor refund, right? If you're a renter or you're a homeowner, but we're getting rid of the Tabor refund to pay for property tax cuts, like that's to me a little bit inequitable. And so we need to help renters in that way too. Um, so um, all of this is a long way of me saying like, there's a lot of work for us to do and I am not sure that it makes sense this cycle to spend our political capital on a bill that we know the governor is going to veto. I think we need to uh, regroup, focus our efforts on some other things, and then of course we will come back. Of course um, this fight is not over. I'm going to be in the legislature for eight years if the people of House District 1 in Southwest Denver will have me, and I definitely see it as a goal of mine to get this done before then. Um, but I'm not sure that it makes sense for us to fight this hard again just to have Governor Polis kill it with, a, with his pen. Um, and so, um, and you better bet I'm going to make this an issue in the next gubernatorial primary. I want all of them, Jonah Goose, whoever's running, they got to they gotta be on record on this. So. Okay. All right. So now we're going to open it up for you all to ask questions. And I think maybe 
let's take this mic and give that to the people. All right, Tina's got her hand up, so let's. I've let's always go wanted with the job of walk around with the mic. Right here so first, and then we'll. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to working. Yeah. Thanks to all the panelists and Representative Mabry. I have a question for you. Um, do you think um, municipality deciding or opting in for rent stabilization necessitates the building of additional units in that? I mean, will rent stabilization not work unless the municipality is interested in building additional units? Do they go together? That's a great question, and I really uh, appreciate it. Um, I uh, do, do not believe that it necessitates the building of more affordable housing. And, and um, if you need a demonstration of this, um, uh, a week and a half ago, I was in New York City. Um, I got to take a week off, and I was visiting some friends out there. And um, we went out to Queens. And out in Queens, there is an entire economy. New York has two levels of an economy, right? There is the economy in New York that is for the 1%, right? And then there's the economy in New York for the 1.7 million people who live in rent-stabilized units whose average income is $39,000 a year. And they live in New York City. And they're running the bodegas. And they're, you know, these are the people that have shops in, in Chinatown. This city, New York, totally. I sat down with the state senator, Julia Salazar from Brooklyn. Um, that city exists the way that it does right now because there are so many rent stabilized units and that working people have a place to live. And this is one of the places where we point to and say, hey, maybe they could do more to incentivize the building of more um, uh, housing in light of that fact, right? And then same, same deal, like my story about Susan Smith in in Oakland like there are hundreds tens of thousands um, I had to remember the population of San Francisco but there are tens of thousands it, but probably um, close to a hundred thousand people um, in San Francisco who get to live there and and finish their kids school there and and remain there because of um, rent stabilization they're they're prevented from displacement and I think that alone is valuable now we also got to have the other conversation. Yeah, we need we need to incentivize more building of housing if we have rent control or not, you know. And so, um, yeah, I hope that was responsive to your question. I'm going to take organizers' prerogative here, uh, Todd. I I would like to know if anything that was said um, would brings comfort to you or makes you think like, okay, that's something we could work with. Good question. I, I'm trying to take it all in and, and learn what this would look like because I've done research on how it's been implemented in the past, but I'm, I'm trying to understand this part of it. I definitely agree with what Javier is saying that we need more housing. The, that up and down the front range, we just have a shortage of housing. So I, I think that would help. The other thing I haven't heard but I'm interested in learning about is if there's any measures in, in any of the bills or proposals to lower costs lower down in that uh, event chain of events you know getting to the point where you're actually renting the property there's quite a bit of expense that goes into that is there a way to lower some of that cost because that could help keep rents down as well hey thanks so uh, a lot of good discussion I'm coming from this with a slightly different angle but it's related to think Boulder. Uh, I'm in permanently affordable housing I think these are very abusive contracts that I'm in. And I think Javier, you brought up some good points about trying to keep people in the community. The flip side, there was a guy who really, really, really wanted my house. He didn't get it. He had to leave the community. Guess what? He bought outside of Boulder. The guy is rich. <laughs> he is thriving. <laughs> and he's, you know, among equals. Um, in my case, my house, if it wasn't in the program, would have appreciated $800,000. But since I'm in the program, at most, but this is before they take deductions, I'll be allowed $20,000. What can I buy for $20,000, right? So um, I think these are very abusive. So when you talk about keeping people in the community, 
I think you have to kind of look at this as, well, okay, maybe this program didn't work. I'm probably the only one publicly talking about it um, because from the city it's, it works. It's just one, one news, but I know other people that have had problems and they don't talk publicly about it. I mean, is that fair that my house went up $800,000 and I get 20 at most? That's after they, that's before they reduce for repairs. You shouldn't get any money. Go ahead. You shouldn't get any money. Okay. But the thing is, I'm a homeowner and I'm doing work and I'm paying HOA dues and my building's falling, you know, at, yeah, over we, time. We paid for you to buy the place. I, I paid all my money to buy my places. Okay. Okay. So I paid for 40% of the, of the house. That I, yeah, go ahead. I paid all of mine. Okay. Okay. We have to do one at a time. So does anybody want to respond? I mean, I could just briefly, like, you know, I think the comment that you're making is outside the scope of the discussion we're having right now, because what we're talking about is people who are renters and don't build equity anyways. Now, definitely, like, the situation you described, um, you know, absolutely does sound um, uh, unfair, but I think, you know, within the scope of this conversation, and I said this earlier, the warranty of habitability is the warranty of habitability, right? And like the vast majority of landlords like follow that law, but we have laws and regulations when you're in the rental space where there's certain obligations on um, homeowners to upkeep the property. And so I think um, um, within the at least the rent stabilization conversation, I think people aren't necessarily going to fall into the situation that you were in. And and you know I I. Um, Empathize with you, with you, and I and I think that your situation is not great. Yeah. So that that is, we wanted to have another panel on that's broader for the public to talk about these different affordability programs. But yeah, this one is on on rent control. But I appreciate your comment. I do appreciate that. Thank you. I have a question for Todd. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm wondering how rent control can be used to keep small landlords like myself in business and encourage new landlords. I know of people who have million dollar homes in Boulder and are my age and they want to downsize and they would think, well, I could go buy two condominiums, live in one and rent the other. But because of such extensive laws now, they don't want to. And I know of other people who I've suggested that they rent out their condos because they're not using them. They said, no way, too much laws. I don't want to bother with it. And then my other question is, is there a way rent control can be used to deal, to help landlords deal with a tenant from hell, especially yes. small landlords. I, you know, I've, I've had a couple of tenants from absolute hell. One destroyed my property by letting people smoke meth in it. And it, yeah, it took about 30, 40% of the value of the house. And the other one was a well-paid psych psycho who went around breaking things and destroying things and blaming it on the, oh, you know that guy, neighborhood kids that he could never describe. And so in, anyway, uh, long story short, are there any ways that rent control could help small landlords like myself? I own two properties and I'm retired. Uh, rent, I think rent control in this discussion is primarily, primarily about the cost, the, the amount of rent. I don't know that it would help you in your situation about which ones to rent, which ones not to rent. Um, you know, there's, there have been some studies about how it impacts the mom and pop landlords out there as opposed to larger corporations that have deeper pockets and uh, larger management structures. I think without some cost cutting, it certainly could affect the smaller landlord in, uh, negatively in, a, in trying to manage their property if they can't keep up with it. And, but some of this may address that. Uh, you know, it, it really depends on what is being proposed here in Boulder. Um, I'm not sure I'm 
going to be able to answer your question. I apologize. Uh, well, our ordinance exempted small landlords. Uh, the way we wrote it, if you rented out three units or less, you would be exempt from the rent control law. So that's that's we left them, we left you out. Uh, what was the other part? Oh, yeah, and as far as bad bad renters, it seems like there should there are ways that you can throw them out if you have cause. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Nah, this is this is. Okay, look, look, look. Yeah, there okay, is. Okay, I think this is where there I'm is. supposed to there talk is, there about is. civility. Yeah. So yeah. We're, we're speaking one yeah. at a time. Please, like, respect that uh, response. Yeah, or just okay. I have a really quick response. There is a one-stop shop eviction. A man, and they would go crazy right now if they knew I was about to give them an advertisement. But the Cheddar Law Firm, for four hundred dollars flat rate, they easily—they are an eviction machine, man. That is—it is super easy to evict in Colorado. That is measured all over the place. That Colorado is like a bottom ten state for renters. Our eviction regulations it's like five pages long in the statutes and in other states it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages we're not even a part of the model landlord tenant act which texas is oklahoma is arizona is like it is not simply not the case that it's hard to evict in colorado and four hundred dollars you can hire the cheddar law firm hi um Thanks for taking my question. Uh, this really goes to any of the panelists. A couple things. One I heard tonight is uh, the, the goal of us um, retaining community uh, in the face of capitalistic markets for rent. But what I have not heard here is any argument for or against uh, the public capital markets in support of housing units. What it seems to me is that we're trying to set setup. I don't see examples of sandwich shops or grocery stores being dictated what they can charge for a sandwich or a cup of soup. So I'm just wondering how do you reconcile that and, and are we missing a very important lever here which is public capital markets to support these types of housing situations? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well first of all, I, I think as long as we expect affordable housing to be produced by the private market and private developers, but there's never going to be enough because their main reason for being in business is to make money. Uh, so I think we need to have more public sector involvement, and I think that starts with public sector financing. So I, I agree with that part of what you said. Uh, I think rent control is basically about fairness and accountability. Oh. Okay, thanks for that. It's, it's about accountability. Uh, even, got it. Even XL has to go to the Public Utilities Commission and justify rate increases when they want to charge you more for your electricity. Uh, landlords pretty much operate on the Comcast model where they can do anything they want and there's no accountability at all. They can raise the rent anytime they want for any reason they want, any amount they want, and there's no recourse. Rent control would change that. So, I, I'll just add to that though that there is a competitive market out there for, for uh, units. There's only one provider of electricity if we're bolder, and that's Excel. They have a monopoly, and that's not, uh, we don't have a monopoly system on rent. I mean, I will say the market is, is uh, maybe not working not. in the way that it could or should, but I don't think it really compares to Excel or Comcast. In the, okay, in the we, we have, the library wants us promptly out at 10 till, so we've got four minutes, so I'm gonna give you the last, Okay, this is, I'm sorry, less of a question than just a, a comment. Clearly, this kind of forum is pretty unusual. 
to have landlord and tenant uh, folks in the same room talking to each other. I'd like to see this more. This is a very short period of time for us to talk about. We're not going to agree on this issue of rent control. <laughs> it's, it's like the nuclear issue of landlord-tenant relationships. Um, but it definitely needs more discussion, and I'd like to see that happen um, because we are in the middle of a housing crisis, and doing nothing is not an alternative here. We need to be doing something. Rent control has the biggest impact by far of any uh, legislative attempt that could be done. And, I, and uh, Javier, I really, I, I really understand the political uh, sense of not going ahead because we have Polis in charge, um, but we could be doing a lot more to prepare the ground for when we are ready. As Todd's, uh, as Todd's sheet uh, says, we've had some exceptional increases in the last couple of years. With these 20, 30% tax increases, um, can each of you speak to how that screws things up and, and the ways in which that can be dealt with because as, as a, both a landlord and a previous tenant, I see that as, as one of the big elephants in the room. Okay, so I'm gonna suggest that you all answer the question and wrap up your comments all in one fell swoop. How does that sound? Okay, and we'll start here and then. Are you talking about property tax increases? Yes. Okay. Uh, I've never paid that directly because I've always been a renter since I've lived here since 1971. Uh, but you know, honestly, if I had my way, there'd be no such thing as property tax. There would be income tax and wealth taxes. And I think it's the worst way to, first of all, it's the worst way to finance schools because it's just, I mean, you live in a place where there's a lot of wealth and a lot of expensive property and houses, your schools are going to have more money. I guess there's things they do to kind of even that out. But uh, yeah, that's that's a gigantic problem. So I'll hand it to somebody who's in the Great. Uh, okay, well, I appreciate, I appreciate that question. I actually have been very vocal uh, on this issue. And I do believe that there's, we absolutely need property tax relief for those who uh, have homes that I'd say are worth below a certain amount. But we also need to recognize in Colorado that Oprah has a $50 million home in Telluride and that Colorado ranks 47th in terms of how we charge property taxes. Now, that reality is not felt in this room because the increases that we're seeing are a lot right now. And so relatively, it is impacting uh, working families' pocketbooks quite a lot. But I believe that we can implement a fairer property tax code where we're giving relief where it's needed and charging fairly on people like Jared Polis who have multiple homes, multi-million dollar homes, things like vacancy taxes or something that we should look at too um, uh, to address this problem. Um, and um, so um, absolutely engaged in that conversation. Um, and then, you know, just as I wrap up, I just want to, again, thank everybody uh, for coming out today. Even if you disagreed, I definitely appreciate the conversation um, and, and understand that, you know, everybody's coming from a good place. Oh, also public housing. Yes, absolutely. Fully agree that there should, there's a role uh, for uh, public housing too. I, yeah, I, as I've been saying, I think reducing any cost is going to help that, um, that chain of events that I described. There are many, many costs up to the point of occupancy and then after the uh, point of occupancy. So reducing that would help everybody involved. So thank you all. Thank you. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I know about Tom I didn't go to them. I went to another attorney. And I said to this guy scares the 
Yeah, I'm gonna come here. Yeah, I'm gonna come here.